First of all, does everyone have, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes? Okay, great. And everyone have seats? Do you want to, there's a couple of people walking in. If you don't want to be so awkward walking through. So my talk today, I, I really think first I want to say thank you, David. What he's trying to do here is awesome. Um, it, it's pretty amazing that he single-handedly is trying to come in here and spawn a community to come in, build together, and do some tech. I think that's awesome. I'm also from a small community, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara you know, is bustling with new startup companies, and it's just because the support that the college community has to spin off these companies and put together incubator space and put together resources so that we can spin these off. And there's been a plenty of successful companies, plenty of successful buyouts. Now we have big companies like Raytheon, Carl Storrs, et cetera, that have come in and taken over and done a really good job. So I'm excited to see what, what David's going to do for Tacoma. And I love how much he loves his hometown from the beginning. <laughs> so about me, because uh, David allowed me to introduce myself a little bit. I got my bachelor's. So it's, it's somewhat interesting. If you look at my name, S-U-M-I-T-A, I went to Stanford University in MIT. <laughs> and my first faculty offer was UPenn. So my name is my pedigree in a, in a sense, but I went to MIT um, where I did aerospace and aeronautical engineering. Uh, and then I went to Stanford where I did my PhD in um, mechanical engineering. I did aerospace and aeronautical, so I was really into fluid dynamics of ga gas turbine engines. I worked in the gas turbine lab, and then I did rocket engines. And then uh, that's when this big MIT micro engine came out. They were making engines this big, or rockets this big to go into space. So I got really enthralled, this was an undergrad, with microfluidics and micro stuff, How, what happens. And for, so my PhD, I decided to go even more fundamental and understand what happens at the nanoscale, nanofluidics, what happens. And it turns out that at the nanoscale, there's no real airplane applications. It's mainly bio <laughs> applications at the nanoscale, so I ended up turning into the biotech industry. But, but you know, before there, I, I got a postdoc at Sandia National Labs, which I think a lot of you know about. This was in Livermore. I also went to Europe to do a postdoc, to live in Europe and check out that research. And uh, about 10 years ago, I became a professor at UC Santa Barbara. Um, other things about me, I did write a textbook uh, about nanotechnology. I wrote a textbook that's now in its third edition. It's being used in about 80 different schools, um, that textbook. Also, we, we um, I don't want to say dumbed it down, but we made it a a available to the general public. So we have a nano, the whole story book that's, that's in Amazon. Amazon or, um, for the general public, so please, it's very easy to read. Basically, it just talks about what's different at the nanoscale, technically, but you know, easy to read, you and how does it change? Book coming, you what? Have a picture book coming out too, which <laughs> actually, actually, they asked they asked for that. It's sort of funny. Uh, I'm also a professional musician. I made more money as a musician than a grad student. I play sax. I, I uh, write my own music and play all this other stuff. And I'm a mom of two kids, so I'm I'm a little bit busy in my life, as you can imagine. So what I want to talk about today is basically what lab-on-chip devices. So what are lab-on-chip devices? Who cares about lab-on-chip devices? We're basically using the semiconductor industry, how computer chips are made. Remember when computers used to be huge and everyone's showing Moore's law of computers going smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it's nothing? We're trying to do the same thing with healthcare. Right now, oh, I don't have the picture. Right now, um, to get, when you get your blood drawn, they have to go into a huge lab. An entire building that is dedicated to taking the blood, doing sample prep, checking out, et cetera, diseases. And what we're trying to do is put the entire thing on a chip, just like a computer chip. And so instead of having a huge lab, you have a com like something the size of a computer that can do everything. So that's what a lab on chip is. And, and why? Why do we care about lab on chip devices? Well, I think you guys can all read. It improves global health diagnostics. People out in the middle of third world countries do not have large labs. Um, very good for healthcare management and everything's hooked up with electronics and everything's done. And personalized medicine, imagine, you know, everything's on this phone and we don't need to go to the doctor because I never go to the doctor and I wish I just knew my tests and I'm too lazy, I'm too busy, I have all this other stuff going on. All I want is to make sure that, you know, I have my yearly breast exam but I'm too lazy to do that. It would be so great if I could do it at home. Improves forensics. Uh, right now, you know, they, they, the TV shows like CSI have have, you know, you stick it in and boop, 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 out comes the answer. But of course, that's not true. It takes a couple days and train technicians, and this will allow you to just do it in a handheld device. Um, infectious disease, really, imagine, you guys know what Waze, the Waze app is? Yeah? Imagine if, instead of Waze, there's another app where it tracked people who had the flu. 
So you could look on it and you say, oh, all these people have the flu. I'm going to stay away from that area. You know? Because, uh, anyways. Um, breakthrough chemical analysis systems. We can do stuff. We can analyze things about your body that other tools cannot do, exploiting uh, physics that happen at the micro and nano scale. Okay? So does that give you enough motivation of why this is the coolest thing in the world and everybody should quit what they're doing and do this instead? Yeah. Um, great. So how do we do it? Now, they said why. How do we do it? Well, uh, the first thing I have to say is the innovation that made this all possible was the integrated circuit. And, and funny enough, none of us, none of us in the field, um, really use silicon much anymore. We use silicon dioxide. We use plastics. We use like all the cheap stuff. But it was the innovation of the integrated circuit because the tools that people use to make computer chips are the same tools where we got our you know, thought from. This is how we can make things, et cetera. Um, and then microfluidics, actually flowing fluid at that scale, is what really allowed us to um, drive fluids from here to there, look at your body, look at, you know, extract fluid, look at it, move it around, et cetera. Um, and so it allows you to do nanoliter scale biological automation. Right? You only need a little drop of blood to be able to move everything around. You can analyze, separate, manipulate, and interrogate individual molecules. There's no other you know, machinery out there that can look at individual molecules. You need tiny, tiny things to manipulate individual molecules. And right now, your machines are big, and they use cuvettes, or they use, you know, you've seen them, you know, your, your hypodermic needles. They have fluid flowing through major tubes. Imagine if it was 100,000 million times smaller. Now you can actually manipulate individual molecules. Yeah? OK. So this is the ultimate goal. Let's see if it works. This is my computer, right? Okay. So of course, that doesn't work. Uh, wondering if I should go on or not. No, might as well. Do you guys mind waiting one sec? Uh, now, if none of these movies come out, I'm going to get really angry. So this is the ultimate goal. Let's see if I can. It's a movie made by my, my drummer. He's a graphic designer. And it was done a long time ago. And the, I do nanofluidics. Right? I build nanochannels. And this was, what, seven years ago now. The ultimate goal is to be able to take any sort of sample, blood, urine, saliva, et cetera, and put it in a handheld device. And this is the device I was building in Sandia National Labs. It's about the size. You know, I can hold it in my hand. It goes in there. It goes through sample prep. It does all the, you know, makes the, in this case, we're just getting out, extracting just the DNA from it. And we put it in our microfluidic chip, nanofluidic chip. So this is the chip that we make in our lab back seven years ago. Now I do a lot of other things. You put the DNA in one side. And then we have, let's say we want to do forensics. And we want to see who this is. We want to see if some, this is somebody's father. We put the other DNA in the other side. And we tag it with a fluorophore. We tag with a fluorophore. It goes down. This is nanoscale. So it, it hybridizes in milliseconds. It's so small, they have to see each other and hybridize. Move, the fluid moves from top to bottom. We can actually manipulate the fluids. We manipulate them with electric fields instead of with pressure. So it's a tiny little circuit. Move them downstream, and we can actually separate all the DNA and measure it with a laser or whatever. And out on the screen of your handheld device comes out a signature, a molecular signature. And that signature tells you who you are, what it is, et cetera. So that's sort of what we've done in our lab. That's sort of the ultimate goal, just a handheld device that allows you to do um, what you want to do in your hand. Um, so I'm a little worried that none of these videos are going to come out now. I spent all. Ah, this works. Um, so how do we manipulate fluids at the micro scale? And what I'm going to do now is be didactic. I'm going to tell you about a bunch of research in my field, just so you know what's out there. And then we're going to spend most of my time talking about my research, right? if you guys don't mind, just I'm, because mine's the best, of course. But I'm going to, this is all other people's research. But I, I want to talk about the particular things I'm doing, just because I'm very good at talking about what I'm doing. Uh, so this is done by Steve Quake. He's one of the most famous people in our field. He's a professor at Stanford right now. And um, he manipulates fluids using pressure-driven flow. So this is PDMS. Do you guys know what PDMS is? Polydimethyl siloxide. It's the same thing breast implants are made of. Um, and it's just a little polymer. And what, because it's squishy, what you can do is you can um, take pressure and push down on it and close something off and then open it up. So they have pressure-driven flow valves. 
right? That opens and closes fluid flow. You can see he has a bunch of different fluid mixing, and, and he's just doing this with dyes. But you can see you can actually move fluids around, mix, separate, you know, analyze, manipulate individual molecules, right? Um, the problem with this is if you're going to use a lot of uh, um, pressure valves, you need all these tubes. So the chip is this big, but you still need a lab of a bunch of tubes to move things around. So it doesn't really solve the problem much. Uh, next, this is getting annoying. Uh, oh, this is cool. Capillary flow. So this is a piece of paper. Just like the pregnancy test, you guys all know about the pregnancy test. It's a lateral flow assay. You, you put some fluid in there and it wicks in by capillary flow. These guys did a really cool thing where they did everything out of paper and they made paper hydrophilic or hydrophobic, so they have some plastic regions and non-plastic regions, they can put a piece of red dye and if they have three different kinds of paper, they can move, see the green will go down and over, and so they can actually move fluids in and out in all sorts of different ways. Does that make sense? Yes? I'm losing half of you now. Wait until we get to my stuff and I won't lose any of you. Um, this is uh, pretty cool. You know, I can go faster or slower. If anybody speaks up, I can skip all this stuff. This I thought was really cool. This guy, um, his name is Scott Phillips. He's at UPenn, uh, no, Penn State. And he's been able to go to third world countries and just take paper. He's been able to make batteries out of paper, electrochemistry out of papers. And this particular thing is just um, a set of paper. And um, he put dye in there, a, a compound and chemicals all dried out that when you put your drop of blood in, it will come in, go through the capillary, and come out. And this, is, this, I think, is just a timer where you can see. Let's see if it comes out. Come on, come on, come on. There's your dye, um, dried dye. And then you know he makes some of the things longer or shorter. So I think this is just a, a, a timer. And you put your sample in the top. And it goes down, in, down, and all the way up through. And you can have chemical reactions. You can have something happen, so it's a sensor. So you use it for malaria diagnostics or something, any sort of diagnostic. And you can see after a certain amount of time, these things line up. And depending on how many light up, it, because they have different concentrations of dye, is how sick you are or how much concentration of a certain disease you have. It's pretty cool. It's all just paper, pennies. Um, third world countries can just use it. And in fact, you don't even need, so this is just looking at uh, peroxide. What's the concentration of peroxide you have? And if you don't even have a watch, you can make a watch, right? Like just by saying, OK, if three, uh, Measure this after three bars come up, and they have a different, you know, a different set of paper for the timer, and they have a different set of paper to do batteries. So it's a pretty neat thing. Um, Aaron Wheeler uh, at University of Toronto came up with droplet microfluidics. So he just puts droplets on metal electrodes, and then you just apply electric fields and use dielectrophoresis to move the droplets around. So you can see that here. Come on, there it is. It's moving. So you can see how you just you can. Um, separate one from each other. You can mix two droplets together. You see how it's moving together and doing its thing. You can uh, um, mix, separate. I don't know what it's doing. I can't have to look. There, it's mixing now, moving. So you can actually manipulate fluid that way. This one's a little bit harder because it, evaporation. So you have to keep everything cold, and there's all that temperature concern. But it works. Um, this is one of the most popular things out there right now. It's called droplet microfluidics. You can take your sample and encapsulate it in oil. And what's sort of cool about that, it allows you to do single cell analysis or single DNA analysis. And there's probably about 100, 100 startup companies in the last two years that have started based on droplet microfluidics. That 100, I'm not even lying. Um, and I can rattle off maybe 30, 30 companies. But they're all um, just, this is so easy to do. These, this little thing that I showed you, all my undergrads learn how to do. You can learn it in a day, how to make these droplets. You can take your blood in, in a couple days and separate out all the DNA, and you can do all sorts of cool stuff with it. So this company is doing everything with these droplets. It's pretty amazing. But what I do, and this is the coolest, I manipulate fluids with electric fields. I do something called electrokinetics. Because fluids at the scale, you know, I just told you the pressure-driven flow had problems. The capillary flow is just paper, and you know, paper is never ridiculously accurate. I told you the problem with digital microfluidics. Droplets are good, but you, know, you still need the pressure pumps and all that stuff. Electric kinetics, all I need is a little battery and you know, two wires. I can apply things on very, very low power. Why low power? Because power is voltage times current. And even though I need high voltage, current 
is proportional to the concentration of your fluid and the amount of ions you have in your fluid. And if I'm only using a tiny, tiny bit of fluid, my current is microamps, picoamps, you know, nanoamps, picoamps. So my power is nothing. My power consumption is less than ever needed in a little, you know, volt, maybe battery or something like that. So I do electrokinetics. Great. Um, that's, that's my stuff. So that's the thing you saw in the video. We have a cross channel where we dry fluid with an electric field from top to bottom and we switch it from left to right. Um, so now I'm going to get a little bit more complicated by telling you exactly what my research is. If it's too much for you, please stop. If you have questions, please ask. If, if I see too many people falling asleep, I'm just going to skip to the next one. <laughs> yeah? Um, so there's three things I think are cool. I'm not even going to talk about, I, so I probably have about 12 projects in my lab. Uh, David was saying um, one of them spun out to a startup company and got sold. The other one is this third one, I think. And then my last company, I'm, not, I'm probably not even going to talk about, um, although it's my most favorite thing. So these are just a few things that I cherry picked to tell you how cool they are. I, I don't know, how much time do I have? I'm, I think I'm definitely going to go over. Keep going. Yeah? yeah. You're good. You're, okay. You're, you're doing great. So when people oh, start falling asleep on the, <laughs> do you know how much time we have? It would be nice. Nobody's telling me. Forty-five minutes. Yeah. Forty-five More or total? <laughs> okay. So this, this, these words sound really complicated. I know, and I promise you, by the end of the forty-five minutes, it will not be complicated at all. You'll be experts on all this stuff. So, uh, yeah, I use electrokinetics, so I need to teach you a little bit of stuff about my uh, electrokinetics. So, what is electrokinetics? Electrokinetics is when I move fluid with an electric field. So, imagine this room, just this part of the room, not all three, this, this, this bay being a microfluidic channel, a channel the size of your hair, okay? So that same size as your hair. That's a microfluidic channel. Imagine we all moved into the piece of hair and we're in this room. The uh, channel walls, right? are um, charged. They're, we usually make them out of glass. You guys have always rubbed glass against your hair and seen the charge come up and negatively charged. The glass is negatively charged. What that means is if I put a fluid inside this conduit, positive ions <laughs> from the fluid are going to be attracted towards the wall. And there's ions in fluid everywhere. Everyone knows uh, water, pH 7. That, what does that mean? It means it has a concentration of OH minus ions and hydronium H3O plus ions, right? So those H3O plus ions are going to be attracted towards the wall. Um, and form a little tiny double layer. That's the width of your hair. Let's see how well I negatively charge channel walls. Positively charge, accumulate the surface. I'm pretty good at this. My student did this, so. Okay, but the rest of it, everything else in the middle is net neutral, right? There's positive and minus charge. Once it shields the wall charge, you're fine. So, for example, if it's the size of this room, the size of the positive charges that are going to attract it towards the wall is the size of the paint on the wall. Very, very, very thin layer. Very thin layer is attracted towards the wall. This is the width of your hair. So this is totally not to scale, right? Um, so what happens when I apply an electric field? When I apply an electric field, you have negative ion going one way, positive guys are going the other way, right? So theoretically, in the middle, net zero flow. But on the ends, the walls can't move, but the positive ions that are attracted to the walls can move, right? So those positive ions move and drag through viscous diffusion, drag the rest of the fluid along with it. So you get this uniform flow profile, right? Where really close to the walls, you get weird stuff happening because the paint on the wall is moving, but it's dragging the rest of the fluid along with it, so everything's going at the same speed. Does that make sense? And I could derive the navier stokes equation with the, with the body force term and show you how it all works, but that might be a little bit too complicated for you. Um, what? Next year. <laughs> I'll be ready. So there's something else. What if I have a piece of DNA or some charged molecule inside this? Well. Let's pretend, um, well, let's pretend it's neutral. I have a neutrally charged molecule, which is very hard to find. It's just going to go with the flow, going with the flow, right? Because it's neutrally charged. If I have a positive charge, well, the positive charge is going to migrate faster, right? Because it's positively charged, it wants to go faster. So you have the flow that's moving it, plus it has this other force. And negative ions, guess what they're going to do? Everybody, come on. Thank you, thank you. It's just for me. I want to see that you guys are not thinking about what you're doing tomorrow, <laughs> which half of you are, but that's okay. Now that I've planted it, you are definitely are. Um, so <laughs> one more, he's laughing. He's like, yeah, shoot, I got to get bread tomorrow. Um, 
So electrophoretic mobility. One more definition. I promise this is the last thing I'm going to teach them when we go to cool stuff. It's another definition. So I just taught you about electrosmosis, which is the whole movement of fluid, electrophoresis, which is the individual movement of ions, and electrophoretic mobility. You guys know properties of stuff, like size of something, color, right? Diffusion coefficient. Have you heard of that? How much it diffuses over time? I know you know because I, that paper, I think, had it. Um, uh, diffusion, diffusivity, and mobility is another one. Oh, duh, it's mobility. So mobility is just a property, and the property is how fast does it go when I apply an electric field? Very convenient to me to have this property. How, and, and you just look it up in a table of handbooks. All, all ions have a mobility, which is basically the uh, mobility is equal to your velocity under an applied electric field, the velocity divided by electric field. Very easy. There's some constant in there, but this is an easy way to think about it, right? It just, it's important for you guys to know this. I'll tell you why in a second. OK, so one more definition. I'm sorry about this. So this technique called capillary electrophoresis has been around for years. And in fact, you know the lab that we go into to do analysis has a bunch of capillary electrophoresis machines. David Hirschberg has personally touched maybe 2,000 of them. <laughs> yeah, taken them apart, run them. They're about $50,000 each. I can make them for like 20 bucks. But anyways. Um, <laughs> And he's had to struggle with all of them, and I can just put a drop in, and it's all done. Um, and so what happens in capillary electrophoresis? Well, those, what, what, what capillary electrophoresis does is you take a bunch of samples, it applies an electric field, and they all separate from each other because they're all moving differently. Remember, the positive and negative are going to move different speeds. Because of their electrophoretic mobility, things with different electrophoretic mobility are going to be moving differently under an applied electric field. Is that too complicated? Maybe not. So I press the button. And look, they separate from each other. Yeah? Makes sense. Good. So this is how we do it in, oh god, I'm not sure this is going to work. This is how we do it in real life. These are the chips. They're uh, microfluidic glass chips that we make in the clean room. I teach all my students how to make them. And then we run fluid from north to south. We have a high voltage power supply that I bought from a friend who made it from scratch. Um, we have a little camera, the MCCD camera. We have a little microscope stage that moves around. And then we just measure, watch this thing go by, as you can see. It goes by, oh, did you see that? It, I timed it perfectly. It goes by, and then we see a little peak where this thing is in. And we can watch this diffuse, we can stop it, we can move it, we can do whatever we want. Yeah? Makes sense. So we, we play with this a lot. And then this is just cool pictures. So <laughs> that's my, one of my first students uh, playing with lasers. We get to do all sorts of cool stuff with lasers because we do a lot of things with fluorescent tags. We tag our biological molecule fluorescently. We don't have to but it's just an easy way to do it, and then we use our little lasers to detect it. This is the chips that we make home-built. You can see my little logo in there. Um, and uh, what else? This is the microscope where we're pipetting fluid into it. Just pipette the fluid and measure it, and look at it in a microscope. Great. Oh, a review to make sure you haven't forgotten anything. <laughs> I don't know why I did this. Um, but this is exactly what I told you. Channel, wall, negatively charged, positively charged, applied electric field, fluid moves. Everyone remembers? Can I give you a quiz? <laughs> Up on the board? Oh, she's ready. She's ready. She heard it twice already. Um, OK. Oh, god. Now we can actually start talking about what I do. Yeah. That was only 10 minute review, right? OK. So this is, this is pretty cool. Silver DNA nanoclusters as mobility markers. Sounds weird, but um, this project was done in collaboration with some physics professors at UCSB, Deborah Feigenson, and my student, Travis Delbanos O'Donnell, Jackson Travis Delbanos O'Donnell. He's now a postdoc at UC Berkeley. He's a stellar researcher. Um, and he did, you know, I have to give him credit for doing most of this stuff. Silver DNA. So everybody in this room knows what DNA is, right? OK. It turns out, and nobody knows why. I'm not a physicist, and the physicists don't know why. So I really don't know why. It turns out that if you take DNA, and you buy DNA, just synthetic DNA, you order it from the store, where you guys know what hairpins are, where like the two legs click together, and the hairpin is all cytosines. If you buy that DNA and you mix it with a silver nitrate solution, you mix it. So I, t I just bought the DNA. I have a little beaker. Anyone can do this. This is all less than 10 bucks. Mix it with silver nitrate and then reduce, reduce it. So I add like sodium borohydride or quinone or something like that to reduce this, the silver from an ion to an atom. The atoms stabilize in those cytosines. It's pretty fascinating. So if I take the DNA and I 
mix it with silver nitrate and I reduce with sodium borohydride, I get this silver DNA nanocluster here. Single strand DNA that has to have a bunch of cytosines in it, in the middle. The silver ions, if I mix with silver nitrate, bind to the DNA. Reduce it, so now those ions become atoms. And usually when they become atoms, they just crash out or they become ions again. Or they, they're like not, totally unstable, right? You can't have silver atoms just stable. But this, these cytosines somehow stabilize them and they fluoresce. If you only have nine or ten atoms, they fluoresce. It's not the same thing as, you know, Latrich's cup or something, which I'll get to in a second. It's just a quantum um, uh, phenomena where now that you have only nine atoms of silver, if you look at the electron orbital atoms and you shine, with a, you shine it with a certain light, it's gonna, the electrons are going to jump up and then emit at a different light. So we shine it with green, out comes red. Right? Shine it with a high frequency light, out comes a, a lower frequency light. Right? Or higher wavelength, lower wavelength. Well, whatever. 488, out comes 650. Um, and there's some ions stuck in there, and people haven't figured any of this out. But I'm an engineer. I thought, hey, that looks cool. Let's use it to like save the world. So I still don't know how it all works. Physics don't know how it works. But my student and I, we looked at that. We thought it was cool. We called up the physics people. We said, we're going to use it to do something cool. Now you're off. She's at least wondering, what the heck are you doing with this to make it cool? I will answer that. Does anyone have ideas? They're, they're used as mobility markers, if you remember the first thing. Has something to do with electrokinetics and mobility. You know that. OK, well, these, these are just uh, other things about the silver DNA, which, again, nobody knows about. If you have nine Cs, in that little hairpin versus 12 Cs, you'll get two different colors. See, the 9 C is yellow and the 12 C is orange. Don't ask me why. Don't, the physicists are supposed to figure it out. They haven't done it yet. Um, if you use different buffers that you put the DNA in, like silver nitrate with ammonium acetate versus sodium acetate, they're different colors. Nobody knows why. Whatever. And they say, oh, you can use it for chemical detection, genetic detection. Have you guys seen the coolest stuff out there, this DNA nanotechnology, where they make little smiley faces out of DNA? Nobody's seen that yet? You have. No? You have, right? Little smiley faces. So, so my physicist friends are, oh, we can just attach it to the smiley faces and we can actually look at them instead of having to put them in a cryo -SEM. I'm like, no, no, let's use them for something real. Let's save the world. So what do we do? Well, we're using it to detect disease. We're using it for disease diagnostics. Now, why? Well, the current way that people use DNA is something called an immunoassay, which again, David knows way more about than me, so this is my very, very, very limited knowledge of what, the, do people know what immunoassays are? Oh, okay, you're gonna know more than me then. I'm uh, Immunoassay, where, you know, you need to develop the substrate and enzyme. You have to develop the, the chemicals that get involved with everything. It costs a lot. It takes a lot of time to do, except for home pregnancy tests. Um, you can't put it in, uh, you can't, you know, stick it in your oven or put it in your fridge. It's, it's temperature sensitive and all that other stuff. And you need a technician, except for the home pregnancy test, to do these things. Usually, again, the lab. So DNA-based assays, because I just said we're doing DNA, is so much easier. DNA is so stable. It's unbelievable. You can throw them on the ground. You can stomp on it. You can put it in the, you know, fridge or whatever. Um, the sequences contain a lot more relevant information. We can pack a lot of stuff in those sequences. Um, and you can put them on integrated chips really easily. I'm just going to show you. And they're very, very good for specificity. So I want to say, you know, David's been working on this too long. Let's do something easier for him. Let's make it out of DNA. So how do we do it? Well, let me tell you what we did first. We took this, this, this is a, we call it a 12C hairpin 10, because there's 10 bases here and 12 Cs on the hairpin. OK? Everyone see that? 12C hairpin 10. And then we added Ts to one end, a bunch of tyrosines to one end. Okay, now if you do that, tyrosines do not stabilize a cluster. Remember, if I had a bunch of Cs here, we'd get another cluster. We'd get another, then the silver would stick. Silver doesn't like to stick to tyrosines. Don't ask me why. Physicists don't know, right? But what we did was we added a bunch of Ts. Now when you add a bunch of Ts to DNA, it makes it more negative and longer. So when I put them in my little capillary, remember I showed you how we do the little capillary electrophoresis? The, the longer the T's, the, this is the tail length, the, lower, the, the slower it's going to go. So as you can see, we put it in this thing. Here's the raw data showing um, T10, T20, T40. They all take longer and longer time to come. And then we have actual data that shows it takes longer to come. OK, why? Why do you care about that? Great. You added T's. You made it longer. How does this solve disease? I'll tell you in a sec. So what we did is we took 
That, this pink thing, remember that pink thing? That pink thing is what makes the DNA cluster. The pink thing is what makes the DNA cluster. I'm going to say it over and over again because it's hard to see. The pink thing makes the DNA cluster. And we tied up the pink thing with exact complementary sequence. So now the pink is totally hybridized to the black. And the green is a target, like hepatitis A, hepatitis B. Some disease target is that green. We pick a DNA sequence that exactly matches a disease. So when we mix it with blood or mix it with a disease, and it's there, if the target is there, then this whole thing is going to open up, right? And when it opens up, look at the pink thing's free to make its cluster. And if it doesn't open up, the cluster won't be made. So just to prove that again, we take this thing. If the target's there, the target will bind to the black thing. The blocking domain will be away from the silver nanocluster forming domain. And then you, you add your sodium borohydrate, and you know, just mix the two things together, it fluoresces. So we did that. We made them. And you can see down here, hepatitis A, just the probe, you see nothing. Probe and target, you see fluorescence. Hep B, just the probe, you see nothing. You get it. Yeah. OK. Um, in fact, this is more quantitative results on the top. The bottom is showing you know, the same exact thing as the last slide, but quantitative. You, know, you can see fluorescence. Uh, we also showed crosstalk, no crosstalk. Hepatitis A only works with hepatitis A, B only with B, C only with C, they don't crosstalk. Make sense? Then we did something even more clever, or my student did something more clever, I think. For each of these probes, the A probe, he put no T's on there. For the B probe, he put 10 T's, remember? And C probe, he put 40 C's. So now, because they all go differently, we can multiplex. We can do all three at once. Now, no one you want to say you can multiplex. Say you have to do one. OK, great. Let's do the next one. OK, let's do the next one. No, we can do it all, all in one. So that's what you see here, the electrophorogram, where this is just the hepatitis A, just the hepatitis B, just the hepatitis C, and all three of them all separated in this little tiny chip, little handheld device. We're done. Thank you very much. So in fact, uh, Travis wanted to, are we done here? Yeah, Travis, <laughs> Travis did some other stuff, but it gets more complicated. He actually designed these probes. He found that these probes aren't universal, and he figured out a way to make these probes completely universal. And so this plus that um, turned into a cool patent. We didn't really want to patent it or license it because he wanted to go do a postdoc, and I have other stuff going on. So the technology office is like, oh, we'll, 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 go. We'll, we'll go to some fair and see if people like it. And it won first place, without even any of us being there and representing it. So I think, I don't know what the technology office is going to do with it, but it's around and there and ready to go. Just we're doing other things now. Um, great. Why are you laughing? That's so cool. Oh, thank you. But I mean, I have like 20 other slides about this that's even cooler. But I figured, don't you want to know other things? And I have 12 more projects that I'm not going to talk about, but I'm happy to. Um, silver DNA, no, cardinal, characterization of gold and rods. So this is, should I skip this? How much more time do I have? No, I shouldn't plenty, skip it. Plenty of time. You want to hear? You guys all want to hear about gold nanorods? Do you even know what gold nanorods are? Anybody? <laughs> He's like, I know you will, because you'll bash <laughs> it down my head. So. OK, so gold oh, you know, this is like a go, uh, gold nanorods. Let's see. Uh, you guys know that if, if gold gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, it's not actually gold anymore. It looks like red or green or you don't know that. Mm. Do you guys know the liturgist cup in the British Museum? where you look at it, and it looks green, and then you shine it through the inside, and it looks red. Transmission versus reflection. I should have shown a picture of that. I'm sorry. I had it here. But anyways, gold nanorods. Gold, uh, if you make it down to the nanoscale, the, do you guys know why metal is metallic looking? Anybody? Come on. Bill Nye, the science guy? <laughs> Nobody? Uh, bill, uh, gold is metallic looking because all the electrons share its orbitals, right? Share electrons, and it just uh, there's so much reflection off that you can't actually get a, a wavelength that comes out at the same time, right? Because it's all over the place, and all the uh, all the different colors have instruct constructive and destructive interference, and all of a sudden it's just shiny and metallic, and you know. Uh, once you shrink it down, so now you don't have orbitals, you know, you don't have as many electrons. Maybe you have two hundred thousand electrons instead of twenty quadratrillion. Um, now, these electrons aren't having so much constructive and destructive interference, so the rods have a color associated with it. So different, um, if you go down to the nanoscale, 100 nanometers, so that's about 100, nah, thousands of times, 100,000, um, yeah, 30,000 times smaller than your hair, let's say. Uh, if you go to 
they're different colors. The, they shine at different colors, and the bigger the nano rod, they're at different colors. This might be a little hard to, to get to. So um, here. So this is uh, the wavelength of all sorts of different nano rods. And the wavelength, in other words, where they absorb and emit light is different based on the length of the nano rod, based on the size of a sphere. If it's a sphere, based on the length of the nano rod, they emit and um, absorb at different wavelengths. So there's a few ways you can look at these things. They're very hard to look at. You need to go to a cryo transmission electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope. You have to look at it with spectroscopy. You can try dark field, but all you see are dots. You can do this thing called surface plasmon scattering, and it's really, really hard to do. But people are using it. Let me see if I have. So, yeah. so people are using this for all sorts of cool things. But there's no real way to look at these things. You know, the whole uh, scare about nanotechnology and what's it doing. You, uh, your sunscreen is titanium dioxide. They're nanoparticles. What are they doing? Nanoparticles can go through the skin. Nanoparticles can go through cells. It's a worry, right? So we need a way to actually look at them and characterize them so we can figure out, OK, these are good, those are bad. Right, because nobody's doing that right now. And there are cool things that nanoparticles can do. For example, nanoparticle, old nanoparticles, a lot of them, if you make them right, they go into the IR, the infrared. And infrared, I don't know if you know about this, but I can shine an infrared straight through this guy, and it'll show up on the other side, right? You're, we're, we're transparent to the infrared. But nanorods aren't, gold nanorods aren't. So I can make him drink a secret potion where the nanorods have um, cancer markers on them, and he can drink it, and if he has no cancer, the nanorods are going to be everywhere in his body, just diffuse. But if he has cancer, you'll see distinct things. So I can shine it, and I can see the cancer cells in his body, right? Because they all clump up against it, just with the IR. And then the other thing I can do is with my light, I can shine it again. IR induced does nothing to anybody, goes through, through him, and it will locally heat these gold nanorods and individually kill just the cells that it's around. Because if it's diffuse like this, you won't feel it, right? It's too diffuse. It's not going to heat up. It's not going to do anything. Here, I just go, zzz, zzz, zzz. you're done. Kids are free. Done. OK, bye. You know, but the nanorods, you don't know about the, and this is work. This is actually data from 2006 that shows nanorods without cancer, nanorods around cancer, and it works and with two different lights. But nobody knows how dangerous this is, right? Like these nanorods, how do you get them out of your body? How do you get them through your kidney? It's much smaller than your kidney filtration. There's lots and lots of issues and problems with this. but. It's an exciting technology, yeah, right? Um, but again, characterization. We have to characterize it. And what we're really interested in is sepsis detection. Oh, actually, OK. What we're really, I, I, we do two projects. I don't know which one I'm talking about here, because I forgot. We do one where we characterize the nanorods, and we do one where we use sepsis detection. Because one out of every six kids die from streptococcus pneumonia, right? It's a bacteria. It's really hard. Uh, we have to culture it up. And you guys all know about this antibiotic resistance, right? The more and more antibiotics we take, the more resistant. These things are so scary. So we want to be able to test it right away and only give the exact right antibiotic to the person who has it. Um, and I think we can use gold nanorods and microfluidics to detect this. So we had a student work on three different kinds. Of, uh, so I, don't, okay, I think I went back to characterization. But what we did here, I'm just going to tell you, is we built a little microfluidic channel, just like the silver DNA one, where we mix gold nanorods with whole blood. Whole blood, remember, we can look through whole blood. And when there were clumps, you guys, that we could tell right away if there was sepsis. And when there was no clumps, there was no sepsis. So we made a little chip that did all that. And it's being tested right now at the um, sepsis diagnostic clinics in UC Santa Barbara. Jamie Marth deals with all that stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, but what I'm showing you here is just some cool data. 20, 45, and 60 nanometer rods. You can see that 60 ones are longer. Well, maybe not, because the scale bar. And they have different wavelengths, all in the IR. Right, infrared, 20, 45, 50. And, um, and we were able to characterize them through this mobility diffusivity thing. I'm going to probably, um, I, I think I might be scaring you with equations, so I'll just uh, skip the equations. But basically what, I'm, what I want to show you is our device. Um, the device that we have that measures, that characterizes the nanorods um, gives you these data for the different nanorod lengths. And we tried um, the the workhorse technique called the Malvern Zeta Sizer. It's a $100,000 instrument. So this instrument is a handheld thing. You know, we stick it in, same thing, about 20, 30 bucks. We tried a $100,000 instrument, and this was their data. So see how much noisier it was? And that's 100 runs per measurement, and they got that noisy data. And then we tried five other companies. And as you can see, our data is right in the middle of all of them and has the best error bars. So right now, we're, trying to, we're not commercializing it, one of these guys. Ooh, Wyatt, who's not even on here is working with us, a particle analyzer, to, to make this a reality. OK, 
that, that was somewhat not good. The, the last thing is really cool. So I told you my PhD was nanofluidics. We did this nano, nano stuff to figure out how we can manipulate biomolecules at the nanoscale. So we were able to do something really, really cool uh, with nanofluidics. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background and tell you how we have a company, right? This company we founded is in the Bay Area. It got like 15 to $30 million. And they have a, you know, a bunch of people working for them where you just take a drop of blood in and it analyzes your whole body. So all through nanofluidics. So uh, to back up a little bit, Remember how I told you how these things separate? Yeah? If you shrink down to the nanoscale, now the whole channel is the size of the paint on the wall. So that paint on the wall that used to be just very, very thin, don't worry about it, is now taking up the entire channel. So now all of a sudden, all this cool physics arises. And that was basically my entire PhD thesis. And now we can do weird things where it doesn't separate exactly the same way. So now you can actually individually pick out molecules, even if they're very similar. Um, uh, it's a little complicated. So, you know, over the years, we wrote tons and tons of papers where we solved a ton of equations. And I don't even want to write the equations down, but if, you, if you're similar, Navier Stokes, Boson Boltzmann, Chemical Equilibrium, blah, blah, blah. We basically counted all the ions that are very close to the surface. Here's my silicon dioxide surface. You have water in here, you have all the different ions. We counted the ions, we did a ton of math and tried to figure out what's exactly happening in these tiny little channels and how can we manipulate molecules. And we actually got so good at this that we could figure out how much, you know, carbon dioxide from the air turns into carbonic acid in your water. So just by having these little nano channels and measuring a current, because we were so good at the math at figuring out how many ions in here, we could tell you your carbon dioxide content in the air. We could measure salt that was coming from the ocean 200 yards away because we live in the ocean. It's pretty crazy. And how did we do that? Well, again, when water comes in contact with silica, look up here, the oh, the H plus ions pop off, and we can measure that. We can measure that with current. And one cool thing we did, which I, I think is so clever, is these are little nanochannels, and we took a fluorescent solution of fluorescein, fluorescein is a dye, that quenches below pH 5, which means you can't see it if the pH is below 5. And we filled a channel with it. You see how I'm filling a channel? And you see how when I fill it, it you see a, a bunch of dark fluid, and then you see the light fluid? Yeah. Well, the dark fluid, the dark fluid, it means it's below pH 5. And that means all these things that are popping off are lowering the pH. And just by measuring these things and doing that math, we can figure out what's going on in the, in the channel. Now, I'm losing a lot of you, so I'm going to skip through a little bit of this and, and show you that if I have a solution, this is actually pretty cool, Integris, which is a big company. Has anyone heard of Integris? Integris is a company that makes semiconductor, semiconductor device machines. So they make the machines that people make computer chips from. And those machines, one of the machines, one of the most important things you got to do when you're making computer chips is a clean. You got to clean that silicon. And to clean that silicon, you need to use ammonium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and water. Right? You need those three chemicals, and they want to save as much money as possible. When I use it in the clean room, we have a 5 to 1 to 1 ratio. When they use it in industry, they have a 351 to 1 to 1 ratio. They want to make it because they want to save money on their cleaning. And they want to go to 500 to 1 to 1. But they can't do that because they, they can measure total concentration with light, but they can't measure individual concentration of ammonium hydroxide versus hydrogen peroxide. So they can't figure out, they know total concentration, they don't know which is which. So what we did in that little tiny channel, little tiny nanofluidic channel, just, you know, is the black one is showing 350 to 1 to 1. Then I add 295 parts per million more ammonia, same exact concentration, and you can see the, con the conductivity goes up. 590 more concentration goes up, a little bit less. And so we can get to parts per million sensitivity just by measuring the current in there and doing all the analysis. So Jetalon, this company uh, who made the, the UV device, is, is licensing from us and selling to Integris, and everything's great there. And this is doing it with theory, no fitting parameters. So you can see we're really, really good. No fitting parameters, just, my, just our, our mathematical theory. Um, and so here's the setup that we use. Again, the whole thing can be handheld, but you see the chip is right there, and we have these off-the-shelf meters that just apply voltage, measure current, and you see this stuff on the computer. But everything is now on the phone. Oh, it's now just handheld. That's what we do now. And we stick it in there, and there's a little, um, there's a little device. So this is actually a little bit different. 
The other thing that we can do is I just showed you the um, conductivity sensor for this clean. One of the cool bio things we can do is you guys know uh, DNA amplification, PCR. Somebody won the Nobel Prize for it, I don't know, how many years ago? PCR amplification um, right now is, again, another $50,000, $100,000 machine where they, every time you get an amplification, there's a fluorescent signal that you measure. Now, instead of putting the fluorophore in there, we can do the exact same thing in this device just by measuring the conductivity. So that's what we do. We can do DNA, and that's the company that's up in the Bay Area. So that's this company, Alveo, and it has a little app where it just tells you the current, the voltage current temperature and tells you how much of a virus you have as, it's, as it amplifies. And it can take whole blood and do that. This is looking at salmonella. Um, and it, you can see that the qPCR machine, which is again a fifty hundred thousand dollar machine, are these dotted lines, and the lines are our our handheld device that we made for ten bucks, um, and it matches pretty well. In fact, we can do it faster. We can make the curves happen much faster. Twenty thirty minutes, we can tell you right away, and it's no trains needed. This is the company now, that's their chip, and this is their little box device that you stick whole blood in, push it in, and get an answer on your phone. Um, so. One last thing, so that they're doing really well up in the barrier, but one last thing is last year I had a major crisis. A year and three, four months ago, my daughter was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I don't know how much you guys know about type 1, but it means your pancreas is gone. It doesn't work. You gotta, uh, we got to wake up three times in the middle of the night to make sure that she's still alive, give her sugar if she needs sugar, give her shots of insulin if she's too high. And so I was contemplating quitting everything I've been doing just to be a stay-at-home mom, but I figured that was probably not a good idea. And so I decided instead of doing that, I'm going to start a company and help her. So use all the knowledge I have and do it for her. So I'm basically full-time CEO of this company that's named after her Lakshmi, Lakshmi Therapeutic Devices. And what we're doing is building microneedles. Again, I'm very good at MEMS. I'm very good at fabrication. I built little micro-engines for micro-rockets. We're building microneedles. That inside the microneedle itself has your glucose, glucose oxidase, has the enzyme, the immunoassay you need to measure glucose. It doesn't go down to hit your pain sensor. It only goes 100 microns down. You won't feel it. It's less harmful than a mosquito. I mean, we've tried it a million times. I can't feel a thing. And it sucks in by capillary forces your, the fluid. It goes through this metal and wirelessly tells your phone what your number is, and it will alert me if she needs to get woken up or anything. And right now, it's in prototyping stages. Then the needle tip is great. I don't want to show you a lot of things because the company has it, but that, and it's all integrated onto a little Band-Aid. The Band-Aid costs a dollar, and we have, you know, razor, razor blade. The, the little razor blade costs a dollar, and we have a little electronic part that goes on top. It fits on our arm, and one at a time it will go in and painlessly, because my daughter cries a lot because of all these things, and it stinks. So we're making that for her right now. So this company, Lakshmi Therapy Devices, is really taking up all my time, although I'm also teaching full-time, having 12 students, 12 projects, all this other stuff, and a couple other companies, and full-time musician, <coughs> not full-time, part-time musician, and full-time mom. Great, and my battery's done. So I'm done. Micro and nanofluidics, I hope I convinced you that this stuff allows for breakthroughs that could never be done at the macro scale, um, and we're paving the way towards actual personalized medicine, just like my daughter's thing, and the, you know, everybody now can know what diseases they have, how, where, and when. Small fundamental breakthroughs are what builds a product, just seeing that we can measure conductivity really well, and we did it with cleans, RCA cleans for ammonium hydroxide, allows us to build a DNA amplification project where we can measure any disease. Um, I don't, oh, this was for another talk. Don't forget, okay. You can don't see. forget the education, excitement, and environment. That was to inspire people. And then that's it, I'm done. This is my group, my research group, my latest research group. We have a high school student in here. Oh, I think he's middle school. And then um, a few undergrads, and that's my research group. Thank you.